racing coaster. While in the land of the rising sun, Japan's Nagashima Spa Land unleashes Steel Dragon, the world's highest, fastest, and longest roller coaster. Hard work and dedication lead up to the final payoff. Smiling faces and opening day. It's all part of the rarely seen story behind the making of a coaster. There are some people who love coasters so much that they've made a career out of building and designing them, like these guys. I'm Mike Boozley. I'm Steve Okamoto. I'm Dana Morgan. Are we ready? Let's go! Let's go. All right. These coaster makers love their work. When they're asked to build two of the most challenging coasters of their careers, they knew the task ahead would be more thrilling than any ride they've ridden before. Our wooden coaster story begins at Hershey Park, nestled in America's heartland of Hershey, Pennsylvania. In this country, there is no wooden coaster that both duels and races. And so we said to great coasters, you've done a dueling coaster elsewhere. You've done a racing coaster elsewhere. How about combining the two elements into one coaster? And that's exactly what they did. So the way the ride works is you start in the station, you leave, both trains head out in opposite directions and engage with their lift. They both go up. The first series of drops are sort of a symmetrical shape. And then they split and we jump into what we call the siphon turn. This is where both trains drop about 72 feet and come out of the pool out six feet apart. This is the high speed racing section. We call it side swipe alley. Both trains are careening through here. The inside train takes the lead. Then our first flyby element occurs where the train split and we go cross one another in opposite directions. We have about a 60 mile an hour flyby. Then we go to what we call the zigzag section of the ride where the, the trains pass under and over one another. They keep changing positions from left to right and they crisscross one another twice. Then we split and we do our last flyby. And then we bring them back together for the finale and race home. The finish line is right here. Nearly 7,000 miles away in Japan, Nagashima Spa Land also wanted a record-breaking roller coaster to add to its assortment of water rides, roller coasters, and other spectacular attractions. I accompanied our president to the United States. Starting at Cedar Point, we tested out and rode various coasters. We were visiting Kansas City's World's of Fun Amusement Park, and we rode a ride called Mamba. Our president was greatly impressed and inspired with the ride, and said, this is it. From that experience, we decided to build this coaster created by Morgan Manufacturing. Mamba was the brainchild of D.H. Morgan Manufacturing, headquartered in La Selva Beach, California. Nagashima Spa Land wanted Morgan to make its new coaster similar to Mamba, but 100 feet taller, making it the world's largest. It's, it's always a challenge and always satisfying when a client brings you a project like this where they want to break some records. It's much easier to build rides that are similar to rides you've built before where, where everything's known and where you're not as challenged. But it's certainly satisfying to be put in the position of having to solve these problems and figure out solutions to things that have not been solved before. The making of a coaster begins here in the design room. At Morgan Manufacturing, a team of 17 in-house and six outside engineers tackles the design of the supports, track, structure, and chain lift. And all of their designs are based on this, the coaster center line. The center line is the center of the track and the actual path of the ride. Steve Okamoto has created customized software to design the center line for the Nagashima roller coaster and view it in a three-dimensional format. This ride will start out with a with a climb to the to the top of the lift. The drop is about 312 feet. At the bottom of the first drop, you'll be going about 95 miles an hour. Then you'll come back up to the top of the second hill, which will be 260 feet. You'll come back down and then up to about 200 feet where you will enter the 
turnaround section. That'll be a 200 foot kind of diving, curving drop, and you'll be almost on your side. You'll, you'll be banked up around 70 degrees. And then you know, you'll come down and do a reversal and go back up to another 100 feet again, and you'll be uh, leaning the other way. Uh, and then back up through a kind of an S curve, and then from there there'll be some rabbit hops back into the station where you'll get a lot of, of the air time that, that the enthusiasts like. Meanwhile, Mike Boodley uses his own customized spreadsheet program to design his center line. Steve, I know Steve actually has very pretty images on his screen when he designs a coaster, but he's designing a ride graphically, and we're designing a ride purely by equations for curves. And it's quite a few numbers. Just how many numbers? Over 85,000. Just like Steve's centerline program, Mike's numbers specify all of the ride's information. The track's height, angle and banking, the spacing of the supports, as well as the structural and rider dynamics and forces. Great Coasters then makes a graphical representation of Mike's numbers to create a profile or side view of the coaster. It shows you all the different elevations of the track at, at any given point. It's just a real good reference for us when we need to go back and see, well, how high is the track right there? Can we, can we clear under that bridge? That kind of thing. Coaster makers then send their profile and spreadsheet information on to structural engineers. We receive from Great Coasters International CAD drawings of the right plan and profile, along with a ton of numbers which we as structural engineers develop wind forces and analyze individual vent structures. We then develop CAD drawings of the foundation details and plans which they can build the coaster from. To ensure safety, all of the ride specifications meet or exceed federal building and safety standards. In the event of a severe storm, the team has designed Lightning Racer to withstand wind loads of up to 100 miles per hour. In the case of the Nagashima coaster, the design team has to factor in Japan's geographical and climactic forces, such as earthquakes and typhoon winds. As a result, Nagashima's coaster will require one and a half times the amount of steel normally needed for a coaster of this magnitude. 8,000 tons, to be precise. Thrills, Chills, and Spills is brought to you in part... The making of a wooden and steel coaster can be similar. Both require detailed field preparations. Plotted land must be surveyed for elevations. Information is reported back to the design office to make adjustments in engineering. Yeah. The designer and engineers then send updated building information back out to the field. Workers can then begin creating the foundation. At Hershey Park, workers dig four foot deep trenches. Steel rods or rebar measuring 5 eighths to 1 inch in diameter are tied together to provide reinforcement. Cement is then added. The finished product is called the strip footing or strip foundation. It will provide one continuous form of support for the wooden framework of the coaster. After we pour the concrete, we place our pedestal, we backfill everything. So basically just all we have is a little pedestal sticking out of the ground. As many as 90 workers, two-thirds of them local, and four million pounds of lumber will be required to meet the nine-month construction schedule. There's over a million bolts and over a million nuts, not including the crew. Mike Boodley comes to the site to check on his design. Well, when I got to the site, I was, I was very excited to see all the piers in the ground. You know, this ride has over 1,000 vents in it. There's probably about 4,000 pedestals. We're probably about 75% of the way there on foundation. And like all construction sites, we had a, a little glitch last night. We had a torrential rain of about almost two inches in a very short amount of time. And so we're working on rerouting that. And um, luckily, that's Claire's problem. <laughs> Because of the rain, we had to pull the rebar back out of this ditch again, redredge it, and take 6 to 12 inches probably out of the bottom to find a good hard surface again. And then we'll have to relocate the rebar back in there and then to pour it. So we've lost a few days because of this. So do you want to start out with...
Behind closed doors, Hershey Park management brainstorms a winning name for its new attraction. Fast track. Fast track. Fast track. Fast track. Fast track. Fast track. Yeah. Dual racer, double dare. Yeah. Racer. Yeah. Oh, Speed racer, dual racer. Like, we could come up with any name to go in front of racer. The team produces a list that it will pass on to the park's top brass. Hey, thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Hershey Park organizes a press conference to announce its new attraction. For the year 2000, we're going to unveil this morning, and it gives me a great deal of pleasure to do so, our brand new wooden racing dueling coaster called Lightning Racer. <laughs> Across the Pacific, Nagashima chooses the name Steel Dragon 2000 for its coaster. The name is appropriate because the coaster opens in the year 2000, which also is the year of the dragon in the Asian calendar system. But Steel Dragon's claim as the world's tallest and fastest coaster is threatened when Cedar Point in Sandusky, Ohio announces the construction of its Millennium Force. Cedar Point promises its new coaster will be the first to break the 300-foot barrier and will reach speeds of 92 miles per hour. Back at Hershey, the crew begins constructing the structure, which will eventually support the coaster track. While wooden beams are cut, nailed, and erected in the field to physically shape and craft the wooden coaster, much of the making of a steel coaster occurs here at the fabrication plant. Morgan Manufacturing is one of the few coaster makers in the world that not only designs and engineers their coasters, they also manufacture their parts. The process begins here on the computer, where design team members can take any section of the track, anywhere on the ride, isolate it, and print out building specs for the shop. In the fabrication yard, giant steel pipes are cut to specification. These pipes are called the backbone of the ride because they will be used to support the coaster track. The flame cutter must reach temperatures of up to 1600 degrees Fahrenheit to cut through the 24 inch pipe. This machine, we have a burn template, which is a paper template with an outline of a part. We've got a photo eye that follows the shape of the part. We've got a torch on this end that cuts that same shape in the steel. Because some track pieces are curved and not straight, workers roll pipes through a bending press. Some pieces require several passes to achieve the desired curve. Over a radius of 200 feet, we can be within you know, an eighth inch to arc depth, so it's a very accurate process. Scribbles that look like graffiti tell an important story. Signatures indicate a part has passed the quality control check, while other writing details direction of track and segment numbers, so assemblers and welders will know what pieces need to be assembled with each other. Thin surface rust covering the steel actually protects the metal during the fabrication process. We take all the rust, all the, all the contaminants, all the oils, everything off in the blast room here. So the sand is pushed out of the nozzle at about uh, 90 to 100 pounds per square inch. You wouldn't want to get your hand anywhere near it, it really hurts. Next, the track is primed, painted, and then top coated. Track sections are hoisted into shipping carts bound for Japan. Each section weighs 7,000 pounds and is marked with an identification number, so it will be assembled in its correct order on the construction site at the park. How does the Morgan team know it will accurately fit the other sections at the construction site in Japan? The way we do that is that we build a section perhaps 150 feet long that will be made up of four or five or six different individual sections. Once we're done, the last section from that setup is disassembled and that one comes over here and becomes the first section of this one and then we build on out again. So in essence we build the track continuously. We actually can start any old place in this ride. Like you can see here, we started here in this area, we stopped and we started down in here. Eventually, once we get done with the structure we're building now, we'll just meet them right here in the middle. 
Engineering feats like this are accomplished thanks to specialized surveying equipment, like the transit device used by field engineers. Site survey and coaster drawing data have been downloaded into the transit device, so when any two known points in the field are located and input, the transit can verify if any part of the structure is perfectly vertical or off base and needs correcting. I can do anything. I shoot elevations, I program in the height of this pier, the height of the instrument from the pier, and it'll do all the math for you and tell you how high that pier or anything else is on the ride. Measuring tools and laser tracking devices are also used to ensure accuracy of assembly for sections of track that will ultimately be located 300 feet in the air. This yard, although it just looks like a, an ordinary paved yard, is actually calibrated. There are a series of uh, monuments. They're casting concrete in the ground. And with those, we can find any point on the ground. And if you'll notice that they, they have points over here where there are actually nails driven into the ground. And those are very precise points that engineering has predetermined for them. And then in addition, we have a laser leveling device that's mounted in concrete and gives us a laser field over this entire area. And then they have a laser receiver that allows them to check the elevation of the bar. So they can find any point in space in three dimensions to a very high accuracy anywhere in this yard. So what they're doing is going through and looking at every point, every tie point on this, making sure that they're all correct and that all of these elements are aligned correctly to each other. And hold it right there. That's on the mic. Okay. On May 13, 2000, Cedar Point opens Millennium Force. Its height of 310 feet and speed of 92 miles per hour become world records. The next day, Nagashima Spa Land places the Crown Track section onto the lift hill. The Crown section is literally the top piece of the coaster. When we placed the crown on the Steel Dragon, that made our coaster the tallest coaster in the world. The park schedules a press conference to share Steel Dragon's ride vitals with the public. Steel Dragon 2000 will tower 318 feet in height, taller than the Statue of Liberty, and will beat Cedar Point's record by 8 feet. Its first ascent is angled at 68 degrees. The Steel Serpent's track will measure 8,133 feet long, which is more than 1.5 miles. If Steve Okamoto's calculations prove correct, Steel Dragon will achieve speeds of over 95 miles per hour. Thrills, chills, and speed up the track. Bents are made up of two legs tied together with horizontal and diagonal boards. On top of those legs, a horizontal ledger is built. That is where the track will be laid. To build the track, workers secure multiple layers of wood. Tracking will take four to five months to complete. Scaling the coaster structure, workers wear safety harnesses tied to beams or clipped to safety lines running all along the track. This is a finished laminate track that we're at. You got your eight layers, bullet, nailed. We're ready for the steel track to be installed. The wood track, it's a piece of steel on the top and on the sides. And in some places where you're going to get some air time, it'll get a piece of steel underneath. Three months before opening day, Steel Dragon's construction accelerates at a rapid pace. Coaster track received from Morgan Manufacturing will ultimately be raised onto each of the coaster's 300 support columns and 800 footings. Workers assemble track sections in the order of their assigned numbers. But in the making of a steel coaster, not every piece of track fits exactly into place, underscoring why it was so important to achieve a high degree of accuracy during the fabrication process. There's tolerance built up in the track, and a small difference in each track section adds up to a lot over the length of this. So we've had to work at getting the track sections to fit where they should. David Miller witnesses the installation of the chain lifts that he personally engineered at the Morgan offices in California. This is for the upper circuit of the chain. They're lowering it in as they're pulling it up the hill with the wind. Very slowly, but when it weighs 30 pounds a foot, you have to take extra caution. Okay, bring her down. 
Oregon Manufacturing is one of the few coaster makers that designs and fabricates its own coaster trains. Because the ride is so much taller and therefore so much faster than any coaster that we've done before, we've designed and are creating complete new trains for the ride. George Olson uses a CAD program that allows him to draw details of the coach in a three-dimensional format. The cars feature the traditional three-wheel configuration that ensures each 80-foot train will stay on the track. This right here, this is the uh, end view of one of the track rails. And this green up here is the road wheel, the main wheel that it rides on. And then this out here is a guide wheel that holds it sideways on the track. And then this down here is the upstop wheel, which keeps it from coming off the track. George's engineered designs ultimately end up here in the prototype shop. So George has printed a full-sized nose here. Now Bob's going to use that to, to, as a cutout to begin to get the shape. The prototype helps the design and engineering teams verify dimensions, spatial relationships, and address clearance issues. George Olson oversees the construction of all three trains. This is the biggest train we've ever done. Everything about it's larger. The, the hitch balls and the wheels, everything's so big. Because this ride is so tall and so fast, we've had to go to an 18-inch diameter wheel. Otherwise, it would be generating too much heat, and we'd throw the treads off the, off the wheels. So they're much larger diameter, which made everything else get larger. The big wheels are a little under 30 pounds, and the, the side wheels and the upstop wheels are about 15. Weight is the enemy on this thing. If, if the train, as is with people, weighs close to 20,000 pounds, and if we pull in three and a half Gs, that's 70,000 pounds of load that we're putting into the structure. Lightweight fiberglass panels are fabricated to help reduce the overall weight of the train. So what we've done on the nose section is that because we are going so fast, that we actually had it fair and fair up as a wind deflector to get the wind to try to go up over the people. Great Coasters also designs and fabricates its own trains. It takes seven months to make all the parts. Then for another month, the Great Coasters crew spends 12 to 13 hours each day assembling the four trains. Each train has 12 cars and 54 wheels. The unique design of the cars may look old-fashioned, but unlike the coaster trains of the 20s, Mike Boodley's cars have been engineered to handle the extremely tight curves of his track design. They also require parts created from modern fabrication methods. At Bob yeah. Patton's Dua facility, a variety of equipment creates parts for the Lightning Racer trains. You can program something in AutoCAD, which is a software package for drafting purposes, put it in the laser, and the laser will make it. This finish is very nice and smooth. This, this is an untouched finish. That's exactly the way it comes off the laser. The crew takes particular pride in the craftsmanship and quality of their parts. The car bodies are made of steel and aluminum, and the running boards are made of oil teak wood. A lot of people are doing fiberglass now. It looks, it's a lot cheaper, uh, maybe a little bit easier, but we like, like, again, we like the classic look and the classic style. Great Coasters also uses rolled or hand-stretched vinyl upholstery with foam padding. It's a lot different from, from most of the other things that are out there right now. We kind of wanted to go with, with the comfort a little bit. Makes a wooden coaster fun. While a Great Coaster has to be fun, it also must be safe. Each of the 12,500 pound trains features built-in and redundant safety mechanisms. Well, we have a, we have an individually positioned lap bar system. Um, this is one side of it, and there's going to be another side for, for this other seat when we install it. And this adjusts to several different uh, to several different heights for different size people. Like a person that's pretty big, like me, I'm felt that I'm down just a few clicks, but if I was riding next to somebody who was very small, they'd be able to push the lap bar down much farther so they can you know, they can be a little bit more secure in the seat. So uh, if I could just get somebody to let me out of here, I could show you some other interesting parts of the cars. Somebody can just let me out of here. Anybody? After the Morgan trains arrive at Nagashima Spa Land, they're hoisted into the transfer track section.
Steel Dragon 2000 logos are applied. Lap bars and parts are checked and prepped. Workers attend to the last minute construction around the station, the souvenir photo booth, and electrical wiring for the lights. At Hershey Park, construction of the Lightning Racer is complete. The 90-foot lift hills are ready to race, and the 68-foot turnarounds are ready to duel. And this is the finish line. The finish line is the moment of truth when riders find out which train won the race. All right, this is the end of the ride. The, both trains have just done their final flyby. They come barreling up. They get right next to one another on this double drop up. They come up, up the double drop, and they come racing for the first set of brakes. These bluish green sensors that you see are what determines who wins. Whoever gets to it first is the winner of the race. Then the brakes start. They're the first brakes on this entire ride from lift top to this point. While Lightning Racer is a wooden coaster, it also uses steel. With the top steel and the side steel on both rides, we basically have around 27,000 feet of steel. With Lightning Racer's track in place, both parks have finished their construction. The next step is to test them out. The trains are weighted down with bags of sand to simulate the weight of the riders. Because the wheel bearings are stiff and need to be broken in, the first train runs are slow, but hopefully not too slow. Hopefully Claire and I won't be crying because it could get stuck. Good luck, Claire. From the second the trains are dispatched, computers underneath the station receive vital information from sensors in the station and on the lift hill. Okay, what you have here is inputs that is out on the actual track. It lets us know or the ride know where the train is at all times. At the same time, it also operates brakes out on the ride, and it will also let you, or it won't let you, dispatch a train, depending on where the other train is at. It is ensuring your safety at all times. Up on the loading platform, another set of controls governs the safety and smooth operation of the ride. Yes, it's slow. We're okay. That was plenty of speed. Congratulations! <laughs> Thrills, Chills, and Spills is brought to you in part by Viagra. Ask your doctor. At, at Nagashima Spa Land, the Guinness World Records team arrives to validate Steel Dragon's speed. What we have here is that they've hooked up a tachometer on the front wheel of this coach, and that allows us to uh, determine the exact revolutions per minute that wheel is turning at the highest speed, which translates then to kilometers per hour. So what we're doing is we're um, verifying for the Guinness people that it is in fact the fastest roller coaster in the world. Calculations from these tests prove to Guinness that Steel Dragon achieves 95.29 miles per hour, a new world record. Meanwhile, Great Coasters contracts GMH Engineering to conduct dynamic testing aboard Lightning Racer, which requires an accelerometer and a dummy named Fred. But Fred is no ordinary dummy. We have a neck sensor in Fred, and uh, we can measure the forces uh, that a, a passenger would experience uh, from the dynamics of the ride. 
The collected data verifies Mike's projected speed and G-force calculations, and that Lightning Racer falls within average safety limits. While Fred confirms the math and science of the design were correct, the dummy fails to tell the coaster makers if Lightning Racer has passed the fun test. That will have to wait for opening day. Well, now that the job's over, it's, it's a great feeling to have completed it, but it's kind of sad to leave the site and kind of turn it over. I guess it'd be like having your kid go off to college or something. We've li we're leaving it in the hands of Hershey Park, that we're, and we know that they'll do a great job taking care of this ride. <laughs> Good job. Yeah, congratulations, buddy. That is done. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Three days before opening day, Dana Morgan and his crew are almost ready to hand over their coaster to the park. But first, they must train the Japanese ride operators on how to safely operate their new record-breaking coaster. Training involves lap bar and seat belt safety, hand signals, and operator control. The Takanaka design team then takes over to conduct its evening lighting tests. The park will dedicate an exceptional amount of energy to make sure Steel Dragon 2000 shines brilliantly through the night. More than 267,000 watts will be used to illuminate this mammoth structure. Steel Dragon 2000 is not just the world's largest coaster, it also may be the world's brightest. On May 13, 2000, the grand opening of Lightning Racer finally arrives. A long line of people stretches outside Hershey Park's front gates, awaiting their first chance to ride the world's first dueling racing coaster. Well, this is a fantastic season coming up at Hershey Park. First and foremost is Lightning Racer. The first riders hop aboard the two trains of Lightning Racer. Screams and smiles say it all. The wood factor on this roller coaster makes it really great. That's, that's neat where you normally see metal. Well, the top things are probably uh, speed. A lot of changes in direction. Dips and turns. Yeah! At the end of today, it's a uh, it's a feeling that any coaster designer and builder would like to feel and see the excitement of the people as they get off the ride. In Japan, opening day is handled a little differently. Nagashima Spa Land's events include a Shinto religious blessing, sake toasts, and the Guinness Awards ceremony. I have here the certificate of citation for that record, the world's tallest out-of-back roller coaster being the steel track. Guinness tells Nagashima Spa Land owner Kimiharu Otani that Steel Dragon has achieved four world records. It has the longest drop and is the highest, fastest, longest continuous track coaster. Before they debut the ride for the public, the park's management and coaster makers lead the celebratory first ride aboard the world's largest coaster.
I didn't see you get on the I tried to talk him into it, but it was down deep. I knew it was going to be smooth, but this this was really nice. Really smooth and I mean, unbelievably fast. Great ride, though. Thank you. Really good. Really, really neat to actually see it in uh, real life. It's amazing how big it is. Never looked that big on my computer. Guests patiently wait in three-hour lines on August 1st, 2000 to become part of history. It will earn them their right to conquer the world's largest roller coaster. the top of steel drive. Its 68 degree drop generates extreme thrill. And I noticed a lot of people um, get pretty excited when they come over the top and they can't see the bottom. It's a pretty interesting sensation and I think, you know, actually in all the seats you, you get that sensation. You really can't see the bottom until you're very far over the, over the top. It was great. The first drop, that was the best. The initial drop and the last ups and downs, it was so close to the ground. Another thumbs up goes to the camelbacks at the end of the ride that deliver airtime. It felt like being suspended in air and flying. Steel Dragon 2000 is a smashing success with the public. Nearly a half million riders will experience this extreme machine in the first two opening months. The successful reception and opening of the ride proves to the coaster makers that their coaster turned out just as they had theorized and calculated. This project has been particularly satisfying because we did push the envelope. We went some place that no one's gone before, and to do that and still bring it in on time and to have it work out as well as it's worked out is very satisfying. It feels like we finally reached the top of the mountain. We did it. After walking around the ride and looking at it, it the whole scale of it and the just sense of accomplishment that we had done this uh, really started to sink in, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a good feeling. Coming up next, Thrills, Chills, and Spills goes behind the scenes of screen parks. Then, climb aboard some of the world's most outrageous and extreme rides. Seat ride with their makers. First up, Lightning Racer, where the heaviest train wins. Well, this is it. Nine months of building, and we finally get to enjoy the fruits of our labor. Lightning Racer's up and running. Mike and I are here today. We're racing each other. I'm on the Thunder side. My buddy and friend players over there on Lightning. Basically, it's a builder against a designer. And uh, we knew this race was coming up, so we both been putting down a lot of food. Trying to increase the old weight factor, you know? But I think I still got plenty of beef. I come home last night to McDonald's with a cheeseburger and french fries. I come home last night with 10 Big Macs, a couple large fries, and a large steak and large drink. And we're round on the top. So here we go, we're going down the drop hill. Got him. 
I beat you. You need a desk job so you can put on some weight, my friend. <laughs> Can't see the bottom of the lift hill. Well, you can't see it until we get there, pretty far over. Track down there? Yeah, there it is. There All right. Going up the same hill, floating over at 240 feet. A little slower up there, that's nice. Time on the third hill. We're still over 200 feet at this point. All right, nice diving turn here. We're shooting back down here again. High, High bank curve at 148 feet. And back down again. Back up high bank in here. That's high bank. It's over 90 feet high. All right. Back turn back here. We're only going maybe 68 miles an hour back here. Pretty slow for this ride. When we reach this point, we've gone 4,100 feet and average 56 miles an hour. All right, now we're going to come back around here, jump up into the B block area, and we get a little tiny rest just for a minute here. Yeah, Big breath, though. All right, because now we've got seven more camelbacks to get home. Hang on, here we go. the structure. Yes. Getting ready to dive into the second tunnel. All right. Back out in the light. Here we are. And there we come into the... That's a great ride, Steve. I think we did a good job this time. I'm sure satisfied with her. From design until the end of construction, the making Lightning Racer has consumed nine months of labor. 341 miles of southern yellow pine and 12.5 million dollars. Steel Dragon has taken three years to complete from initial concept to opening day. 280 track sections and 300 supports were required to build the 16 million pound mammoth coaster. Price tag, 52 million dollars. But creating a world-class coaster requires more than money or materials. Making of the coaster for us is not, I don't know if people think that it's glamorous or anything like that, but, you know, I mean, the bottom line for us is, is it is uh, a lot of work. A lot of sweat. A lot of long, long, tiring days. I think most people don't realize what the entire scope of the project is. And perhaps don't understand how much engineering goes into it and then how much total coordination is involved. First and foremost, we have to give a park a spectacular ride that people are going to want to ride, they're going to want to run around and get in line again. And we have to give them a very safe ride because millions of people will ride this ride from the state forward. Steel Dragon 2000 and Lightning Racer's unprecedented achievements appear to spell the end of their stories. Yet, coaster lovers around the world delight in knowing that the openings of these two giants herald the making of the next great coaster. Stay tuned as Best of Discovery Week continues with more thrills, chills, and spills on Scream Parks coming up next. And don't miss Bike Weekend starting Saturday night at 8 Eastern and Pacific, only on the Discovery Channel.